get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome to class. My name is Curry Sotner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And today we're going to talk about all 27 amendments in about 27 minutes. So we like to say that this class is super fun, super fast, a light touch of the amendments and the amendment process. And it's like speed dating for the amendments. But to do this great work, I am so honored to be here with Professor Kermit Roosevelt. Professor Roosevelt is a professor of constitutional law at the University of Pennsylvania. He is also a fantastic teacher of this content for every age bracket. He's got one of my favorite MOOCs I've ever seen on the Constitution, and he's just a really good friend of the Constitution Center. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Professor Kermit Roosevelt. Um, Kermit, would you like to say anything about to our students before we kick off? Well, thanks so much for joining. Thanks so much for having me. Um, this should be a lot of fun. We are going to have to go very fast. Um, I hope that, you know, if we can't get into enough detail on some of these, it will pique your interest and you can look further into the great resources that the National Constitution Center has. And that's a great point. So after class, we always share out a roundup. And uh, Professor Roosevelt, you can do what Jeff always does, and we call, him, call it Jeff work. So you can have Kermit work, and you can assign things that people should read as you go. And we'll make sure to send everybody the link after class so they get access to those documents. Now, I want to talk about all 27 amendments. I want to talk about the 28th Amendment that our students want to propose, maybe. But before we can talk about all those amendments, we have to take a beat on how do you actually amend the Constitution. Constitution. So I have this beautiful graphic. Would you mind walking us through the amendment process in Article 5? Sure. So there's two different ways an amendment can be proposed. One is from Congress, which is the way most of them have been. So two-thirds of the members of each House of Congress can propose an amendment, or two-thirds of state legislatures can call for it. So you can get around Congress if Congress is blocking things. But you need this proposal, and then you need ratification. And ratification requires three quarters of the states either acting through their legislatures, which is the normal process, or they can act in a ratifying convention also. Awesome. You did a really good job keeping that short and sweet. We're going to do it, Kermit. I feel very positive today. Okay. The other thing that we like to do when talking about the amendments is group them and kind of show some patterns that we can find in these amendments. Um, so feel free to share not just the groupings that I have on this next slide, but any other patterns as you've been teaching these over the years that you've noticed about the amendments? When have they come? How? What was the significance of some of them moving forward? And is there any way to organize them in a structural way? Yeah, there definitely are ways to organize them. Um, and you know what you have here is basically right. I think this is the way people basically do it. So constitutional change comes in bursts. It reflects sort of big changes in the national mood generally. So founding period, we got our first 12 amendments. We fix a couple of mistakes in the Constitution, and we put in some amendments, the Bill of Rights, first 10 amendments, which protect individuals against the federal government and do a bit to empower states. So the theme of the first 10 amendments really is the federal government is dangerous, the states are the good guys. Then to get to Reconstruction, things flip. Um, my personal theory, it's in my book, is Reconstruction is really a rejection of the founding constitution. This is an idiosyncratic view. A lot of people will say Reconstruction is the fulfillment of the founder's ideals and the Declaration of Independence. But everyone agrees there's a very different view here. Right now, the federal government is good the states are bad. So now we get a bunch of limits on the states, which we didn't have before. We get more power given to the federal government. And we get a real concern with democracy for the first time. We get an expansion of, of voting rights, federal rules on what states can do with respect to the right to vote. So that sort of gives us modern America, our modern framework. The progressive era, the next one, has a vision that the government can be a force for good and we can improve government and we can improve democracy. So the federal government gets more powerful and we take more steps towards improving the functioning of the democratic process. And then the modern era, I don't think is that cohesive. I mean, it's, it's a long gap. It's not a single burst driven by a particular ideology. And I would say there, we're fixing more mistakes. So there's some sort of technical mistakes. And we're also paying attention to democracy. So we got some democracy promoting amendments there too. And we always had trouble naming this. We're like, it's the modern-ish era. Like we're like, we're not really sure how to name it. I love that 
that juxtaposition that you pointed out between the founding era and the tonalness of those and the reconstruction. And I'm going to share with everybody after class in the roundup, two great paintings that we've used to kind of show that moment. There's a painting from the founding era that shows like you know, the, the federal government coming in to, you know, to do this work and protect the people and the people saying that this is the balance. We, we don't want you to have too much power. And then the flip of that with the reconstruction, where it's like the federal government coming in to protect the individual's rights. So I'll share out those paintings. They're a great way to teach this, but let's dive into that founding era bucket and look through the first 12 amendments in that era. So would you like to start with Madison? It's kind of hard not to start there with the Bill of Rights, but we'll kick it off with the Bill of Rights. Yeah, sure. So the Bill of Rights, you can really consider part of the original Constitution, I think. So when the Constitution was being debated, some people said, we need a Bill of Rights. We need limits on the federal government. We need confirmation of individual rights. Some states actually tried to make their ratification conditional upon the addition of the Bill of Rights which may or may not have been effective. But in any case, it wasn't a surprise. Everyone knew we were gonna get these amendments. The important thing about it that I would stress is they only bind the federal government. They protect individuals from the federal government because the federal government is thought to be the threat. States are supposed to be the good guys, the protectors of liberty. And the Bill of Rights wasn't actually considered that important at the time. It's not even called the Bill of Rights um, until the sort of early 20th century when it starts being applied against the states. And it's the application against the states that gives us a lot of the big cases that we now think of as Bill of Rights cases. But if you look carefully at a lot of these cases, First Amendment cases, Fifth Amendment cases, they're individuals asserting rights against states, which means they're really 14th Amendment cases. So the Bill of Rights, sort of nice building block, but not as significant as it is now. Fantastic. Um, and I think that's that's like a kind of a mind blower for most of our students, because when you talk to people about, you know, what do you think of the Constitution It is almost always the Bill of Rights that they go to. It is almost always that like that's their connecting point to the Constitution. And typically a lot of time it's the First Amendment for people. It all depends on the group you're talking to. Um, but you, a lot of times we see that at the museum in Philadelphia when people walk in and you say, what do you think of when you think of the Constitution? And they say, speech or press or something to that effect. So let's start walking through those amendments and let's kick it off with the First Amendment. And this will always be my question. So was the First Amendment intentionally supposed to be first? And we talk about it as the First Amendment now, but was that the, the original plan? No. So people like to say, oh, they put it first because it's the most important. Uh, but it's actually not true. It wasn't the first one that Madison proposed. Madison had a bunch of different amendments. Not all of them made it. This is the first one that made it. We'll see later, of course, one that didn't make it for a long time comes along kind of at the end. Uh, but Madison had a bunch of proposals that didn't make it. He wanted to put some restrictions on the states. He wanted to codify the right to revolution, actually, in the Constitution. So this is just the first one that made it. But nonetheless, it's very important. Awesome. Um, very important. It's got the five freedoms in there, religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. Big ones. Now we group the next two together. We like groupings. I believe these grouping sets are from Akilah Mars book, um, but I know a lot of professors use some version of it. So feel free to tweak as you go, um, Professor Roosevelt, because I know you have these groupings as well. So we look at the second and third amendment. So kind of walk us through what is the second amendment about? Uh, what are kind of the pieces of it? And then then we can um, check out the third amendment, which is probably talked about the less than uh, we talk about other amendments. <laughs> sure, yeah. So the second amendment is really trying to create a balance between federal and state authority and power. And it's setting up the state militias as security for the nation, which means you don't need a federal standing army. And people were concerned about that because they thought a standing army was a tool for tyrants. Um, but it's also setting up the state militias, if necessary, as a military check on the federal government. And in Federalist 46, Madison talks about this explicitly. If they have to, the state militias will fight the federal government and they will win. So that's the vision behind the Second Amendment. Awesome. And then the Third Amendment, which I know our Scott, who was on earlier, he's our chief editor, he's the writer of the blog. He's written a lot of pieces on the Third Amendment. So he's super obsessed with the Third Amendment. How often does it get talked about in constitutional law? 
it gets talked about mostly as a, as a joke, really. It's <laughs> sort of like a quirky choice for your favorite amendment because it's been very successful in the sense that it's not really invoked much. People don't say, my Third Amendment rights are being violated. Um, but it's about a practice that the British engaged in that the colonists disliked, and a lot of the Bill of Rights provisions are like that. You can trace a bunch of them back to complaints in the Declaration of Independence, and one of them is he's been keeping bodies of troops among us and quartering them in our houses, which is a way of oppressing people. Awesome. Okay, now we were sharing in the chat our favorite amendments to learn about because it really is hard to pick a favorite amendment. Um, and I agree with June that I love the 14th and I can't stop learning about it. But I am overly obsessed about the Fourth Amendment. And I feel like this is a fantastic one for high school students to really talk about. So can you unpack the 14th Amendment? Why did we get it? Um, and then how it really can be used today in our own lives? Well, the Fourth Amendment is probably the amendment, fourth and first, I guess, is the one most often invoked by high school students. Because, like, what happens to high school students? Teachers tell them they can't say things and their belongings get searched. So the Fourth Amendment is what protects you against unreasonable searches and seizures. And again, this is a reaction to objectionable things the British government was doing, where they would just go into your house and look for whatever, you know, on the chance that they might turn something up that could be used against you. So the Fourth Amendment says no unreasonable searches, it puts limits on warrants, and it says you've got to say what you're looking for and you've got to have a reason to sus suspect that you're going to find it. Awesome. So it has to, you can't be all over the place, there's no more general warrants, um, and you have to be specific and on point when you're violating somebody's privacy that much. So how much does this idea, because I just I just dropped the word privacy there, how much of this idea of privacy is wrapped around these amendments? And then that'll lead me to another question. I'm sorry, this is why we're never on time because I asked too many questions. Um, and students, feel free to ask those questions in the chat too. How, many, how much of the big ideas like privacy and like other things are not always explicitly spelled out in these amendments, but are really about the value and the point of these amendments. Yeah, so one thing you can say is you can look at the amendments and they've got specific provisions and specific limits, and then you can connect them in terms of themes. And if you're talking about the theme of privacy, the Fourth Amendment is clearly a big one, because why do you not let the government go into people's houses just because it wants to look at what they have? Privacy. Um, you could say the same thing about the Third Amendment, right? Respects the sanctity of the home. You could say the same thing about the Ninth Amendment, maybe, which asserts that we've got retained rights, as we'll see. So awesome. you and can find a theme. Right? Yeah, and Stringing I love amendments that. together. And I think it's very important for us to look for those big overarching themes because these amendments are short. And so what are the meanings behind it? And then also we can look at some of the primary sources around the writing of these amendments and where did the ideas come from and the stories behind the people. So are there any good stories that we should look up after class that could help give unpack the Fourth Amendment for us? Um, there's a, Akhil Amar has a good article, Lord Camden Meets Federalism. I think, mm. which tells you some of that. And actually, like, Akhil Amar's work on this, all of this is really incredible. So the Bill of Rights, Creation and Reconstruction, specifically about the Bill of Rights, and then America's Constitution, a biography, will actually walk you through clause by clause, amendment by amendment. Awesome. Um, I always like the Otis, the James Otis story, too. That's always one of my favorites. Okay, let's jump to the Fifth Amendment. So tell us, there's a lot in the Fifth. This one's a little longer than the others. So what's the Fifth Amendment about, other than pleading? Well, there's an enormous amount in the Fifth Amendment. Um, a lot of it has to do with fair process and criminal trials. Uh, they also put in the takings clause. I'm not exactly sure why it's in the Fifth Amendment, along with these sort of criminal procedure ones. And there is the due process clause, which is going to turn out to be enormously broad the way the Supreme Court has read it. Awesome. And we have the fifth kind of in two different areas. We have it as a standalone, but also, like you just said, a part of, you know, the second grouping that we have of the Bill of Rights, which is the fifth through the eighth amendment. And that looks at fair process, jury rights, all those amendments grouped together in that subcategory. So you just kind of walked us through the fifth amendment. Let's take a look at the sixth amendment. Sure. So constitutional criminal procedure, big topic. It's like its own special course. We've got a bunch of protections for criminal defendants in the Fifth Amendment, as we said, like the right to remain silent. Um, and then the Sixth Amendment gives you more specific rights also. So speedy and public trial, impartial jury. You have to be informed of the charges against you. You have the right to confront witnesses, to cross-examine them. 
and you can call your own witnesses, compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in your favor, um, and the assistance of counsel. Although originally that didn't mean that the government would give you a lawyer if you couldn't afford one, it just meant you were allowed to hire your own. Hmm. Fascinating. Okay, Seventh Amendment, we're cruising now. Right. So Seventh Amendment gives you a right to a jury trial in civil cases. Um, now, interestingly, they put $20 in as the threshold here thinking it's only for the important cases, right, where $20 or more is at stake. Um, obviously, they weren't taking inflation into account. Seriously. Um, now, when we talk about te people tending to love amendments, I have always noticed that there's a love of the Eighth Amendment for kids learning about it when they're in middle school. They're really interested in this idea of, you know, excessive bails, but also of cruel and unusual punishment. And for me, that's always tricky how you define cruel and unusual punishment. It's got to change over time, right? Yeah, well, so when I go through the Constitution with my law, my law students, I do actually stop here and I say, how do you decide what's cruel and unusual, right? Unusual seems like that means not a lot of people are doing it. And that's a very natural understanding, actually. If you're, what you're thinking is, we're trying to regulate the federal government. We don't want the federal government to stray too far from what the states think is appropriate. And so we're using sort of state consensus as a constraint on the federal government. But of course, that will change over time. And the point of that is, you can be an originalist, right? You can say the meaning of this doesn't change. But that constant meaning, right, don't do things that a lot of states have decided are too cruel, is going to give you different outcomes. So at one point, it's okay to whip people. Now it's not. Yeah, it's fascinating to kind of like dive into that contextual history of the, the time period to understand how these words like hold meaning. Now, the next two amendments, the ninth and 10th, I feel like we don't talk about enough, but they're pretty important amendments. And they're wrapped around this idea of popular sovereignty, the people have rights, the people as us and the people as the state. And one of our students, Jacqueline, already pointed out that one of her favorite amendments to learn about is the ninth amendment. So can you walk us through nine and 10? Yeah, so the Ninth and Tenth are important amendments, I think. They don't actually play a big role in Supreme Court decisions. There's not a lot of Ninth and Tenth Amendment jurisprudence, more with the Tenth than with the Ninth. The Supreme Court has done almost nothing with the Ninth Amendment, which is a little bit surprising. So the Ninth Amendment responds to a concern that some people had about the Bill of Rights, which is if you list some rights explicitly, the government is going to say, oh, those are the only rights you have. So if it's not written down in the Constitution, you don't have that right. We can do whatever we want on that issue. Um, and the Ninth Amendment is clearly designed to rebut that argument. So it says, the fact that we've listed certain rights doesn't mean you don't have others. Now, it's strange because a very common form of constitutional argument is, show me in the Constitution where that right is. Ninth Amendment seems like a response to that, but it actually hasn't taken that role in the Supreme Court's decisions. And then the Tenth Amendment, sort of similar, but instead of individual rights, it's about the powers of the states. So it's also telling us the states retain powers that they didn't either surrender to the federal government or have taken away from them by the Constitution. So the Constitution tells states they can't do some things. They can't make treaties. They can't have their own currency. They can't have armies. Um, and then they surrender some powers to the federal government, the power over foreign affairs, for instance. But the Tenth Amendment says, apart from those two categories of things, the states retain all the powers they had before the Constitution was adopted. Fantastic. I always like the thought of the Ninth Amendment was like the catch-all amendment, like just to safeguard and catch all. Now, the Eleventh Amendment is, again, one that people don't talk about as much, but it's a pretty interesting amendment. So walk us through the Eleventh Amendment, and then we'll get to some of my favorite stories on the Twelfth Amendment. The Eleventh Amendment is interesting, and it's very complicated. The Supreme Court has done a lot with it, and there's a lot of legal scholarship about it, too. But basically, this is fixing a mistake. So the original Constitution says that federal courts have jurisdiction over suits by citizens against other states. And this means apparently that you can sue a state in federal court and hold it liable even if it wouldn't allow that suit in its own courts because it would assert sovereign immunity. So this is about the immunity of the states. And that happened. An individual sued another state in federal court. The state was ordered to pay money. People didn't think that was appropriate, so the 11th Amendment revises part of the federal judicial power grant in Article 3 and says the judicial power does not extend to suits by a citizen against another state. 
and, and that's what I find it kind of find interesting about the 11th, 12th, and a few others later on. And you said it earlier, some of these amendments are fixing issues, fixing issues that they maybe didn't realize would happen um, and things didn't play out the way they originally intended. And that leads us perfectly to the 12th Amendment. So how it did the 12th does. Amendment come about? <laughs> yeah, so the 12th Amendment is fixing a huge problem. And it's, it's sort of ridiculous the way this happened. Um, and it shows you something maybe about how there's definitely things the framers didn't foresee. And the biggest of those is probably the party system. So if you don't have parties, it would make some sense to say, let's just have one election for president and vice president. The person who gets the most votes is the best leader. They're the president. The person who gets the second most votes is the second best leader. They're the vice president. It doesn't work out once you have the party system because now you've got slates running. And they sort of tried to take that into account but in the election of 1796, things went wrong because people voted for their presidential candidate and then they sort of split their votes for the vice presidential candidate. So the leader of one party got the most votes, that's John Adams, and then the leader of this, the other party, Thomas Jefferson, gets the second most votes. So now Adams is president and his hated rival Thomas Jefferson is vice president. Terrible mess. You might think they would fix it and they sort of tried to fix it. So in the next election, 1800, everyone is like, okay, we're all going to vote for our leader, and it's Jefferson and Adams again, and then we got to make sure to get enough votes for our second place person to get them over the threshold if we win, right, so we don't get one from each party. And they did that, but they did it too well. So they were supposed to withhold one vote for Aaron Burr so that he would come in second behind Jefferson. But they didn't do it. Like, whoever's job that was just forgot. Burr and Jefferson get the same number of electoral votes, so it's a tie, and now it's not clear which one's going to be president, which one's going to be vice president. Everyone knows what the intent is, but the election gets thrown into the House of Representatives. It's resolved um, by the Federalists, ironically, because the, the other party is still in control of Congress. It's the lame duck Federalist administration. They do end up picking Thomas Jefferson, which is what they were supposed to do, but it's clear the system is not working. So the 12th Amendment revises that. Awesome. And Hamilton has a little bit to play in there too, right? <laughs> Since we've all does, listened to the musical. <laughs> the musical presents it in a very misleading way, to be honest. It's pretty yeah. complicated. I couldn't write a song about it myself. So. <laughs> I have to say, when I saw the musical in New York first, I was like, I think you all forgot to mention that a lot of this happened in Philadelphia. So there's there's that moments. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. So my favorite, talking about fixing this huge mistakes, huge travesties, you know, we, it leads us to the Reconstruction Amendments. And these are my favorite re amendments to talk about. So we look at the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment that happened during Reconstruction. But let's be honest, not everybody understands what those terms mean, Reconstruction. So what is this time period? How do you define reconstruction? And then kind of walk us through, and here's the beautiful graphic that I was referencing earlier. Walk us through this time period and then the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Yeah, so reconstruction, I think it's impossible to overstate the significance of the change here. And I sort of alluded to it before by saying, under the original constitution, the states are the good guys. The federal government is the threat to liberty. That's why we're empowering the state militias to fight the federal government, to protect the rights of the states and their citizens. And I would say that's kind of what happened in the Civil War, right? The state military forces fought the federal government. The original Constitution, the Federalist 46, they kind of think the states are going to win. The states are supposed to win. But they lose. And I think this is kind of the end of the founders' vision. So this is me being idiosyncratic. A lot of people will say, no, look, this is when the ideals of the Declaration of Independence are put into the Constitution. I have a different story about that. But um, now we get the idea that you can't leave it all up to the states. That's sort of the big thing that everyone agrees on. We need the federal government to intervene between states and their own citizens, and most fundamentally, the newly freed, formerly enslaved people because obviously the states aren't gonna look after their rights, the states aren't gonna protect them. So you've got the federal government coming in here, defending the rights of individuals in a way that it never has before. And that's like that's what I love about, I think this is a lithograph actually, not a painting, but I really love about this painting because it's setting up like who's the person in the center, what are they representing? And they're representing that federal government and that's where the flag is straight behind them. So we absolutely love using art and like decoding the art as well as decoding the documents around it. So let's decode the amendment. When we look at the 13th Amendment and it's going on in the chat right now, we're talking about what is the 
what does the 13th Amendment do? And then please address the loophole in the 13th Amendment as well. Yeah, so the 13th Amendment banned slavery. And this is like one of the clear outcomes of the Civil War, right? We had a war. It was basically a war over slavery. The anti-slavery side won. Slavery is banned. Now, it says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, shall exist. There's a question, I guess, a sort of a live question about whether that's a loophole for slavery as well. I don't think it's ever been tried. I don't think anyone said you've been convicted of a crime, now you are a slave. Um, you could read the text that way. But involuntary servitude as punishment for crime, that's clear, that's been done. And in the former Confederate states after the Civil War, that was done as part of a broad, comprehensive attempt to basically reimpose slavery. So you set up a web of laws, you trap people within this web, you convict them of something, and you're like, okay, now you are sentenced to work on this plantation. So you can basically reinstate slavery um, through a system of laws that set up obligations that people can't meet and impose inv involuntary servitude as punishment. And, you know, there's a strong connection between that sort of web of laws to overcriminalization today and the, who gets caught up in that web. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I know we have a bunch of programs that really unpacks that because we could spend hours just talking about that, talking about the history of chain gangs, like all of all of this conversation around it. So we'll send that out in the follow up as well. As as you all know, doing light takes on each of these, even though we feel super guilty and want to spend eight hours talking about the 13th and the 14th Amendment. So sorry, Kermit, that I'm doing this to you. Real quick overview of the 14th Amendment. <laughs> Okay, so the 14th Amendment, hands down, most important amendment in the Constitution, changes America more than anything else. I think, like, pretty much everyone agrees on that. Um, let me mention my book now, The Nation That Never Was, talks about the way in which the 14th Amendment restructured society. First sentence, super important, birthright citizenship. This is actually, like, the most controversial thing. This is why Congress had to dissolve the southern states and create new ones, basically because the former Confederate states were not willing to accept blacks as citizens. So Dred Scott, the infamous decision says blacks can never be citizens. 14th Amendment says anyone born in the United States is a citizen regardless of what the states want. Big denial to the states of the ability to define their political communities, which is kind of the central value of the Declaration of Independence. Um, so now we're saying there's a federal definition of citizenship being a federal citizen makes you a state citizen. Federal citizenship is primary. And you've got federal rights. That's what section one goes on to say, right? If you're a federal citizen, you've got privileges or immunities. You can't be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process. And you're, all persons actually, are guaranteed the equal protection of the laws. So federal definition of citizenship, rights that come with citizenship, and also some rights that extend to all persons. And there, we'll save some questions towards the end, but there's a lot of questions around this and some modern cases, um, Roe v. Wade and Dobbs as well. So we can kind of unpack that towards the end. Um, right. But remember- yeah. So also, what are these rights? Lots yeah. of different rights. But one big thing to say is the Bill of Rights. So this is where the Bill of Rights comes in. This is why you have free speech rights against the states, for instance. Who the states have been, had been, you know, quelching free speech rights and freedom of religion rights for years. It wasn't like they weren't doing that. And this really is the sticking amendment. It ensures that the Bill of Rights over time is sticks to the individual and not just against the federal government. Now, that brings us to the 15th Amendment. Um, so this is about African-American men having the right to vote. So one of the questions I have for you was, were African-American men voting in America before the 15th Amendment? Yes, they were. You know, I mean, certainly not in the former Confederate states, but sure, free black men were voting in the North. Free black men participated in the ratification of the Constitution. And I think that's really important because when we talk about putting these amendments into the document, it doesn't always mean that nothing happened before. It does mean that we believe we're codifying this value and this belief into the document. Now, the one other thing that I wanted to point out before we jump past the 13th, 14th, and 15th, what when people call it the second founding, what is it about these three amendments that feels a little different than other amendments, that they have this kind of different shift of power in those as well? Can you talk a little bit about the enforcement clauses in each of these? Yeah, so 
the vision of the founding, I said, was the federal government is the threat to liberty. The states are the ones who are protecting it. And if you look at the original Bill of Rights, it says Congress can't do a bunch of things. Congress shall make no law. And it does empower the states in some ways. So protecting state militias gives the states military power. And then the Reconstruction Amendments flip that, right? Now you've got no state shall instead of Congress shall make no law. Prohibitions on the states. And you've got a big grant of power to Congress, right? So Congress has the power to enforce these amendments. That means Congress can make laws that it couldn't make before. So the original federal government, lawmaking power is pretty limited. Now Congress can legislate against the badges and incidents of slavery. It can legislate to guarantee equal protection. It can legislate to protect the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States. So a lot more federal power. Is it really? kick in that much until <laughs> so maybe the 1950s and 60s. But let's jump to the progressive era really quickly because I know we're running out of time. And I told you it is always hard to get all of these in, especially because we ask a lot of questions. Right. So we I'm can fly through. And we, you're doing great. It's it's more me. <laughs> um, let's fly through these and we can probably like bookend a couple of them, the prohibition ones as well. So yeah. 16th Amendment. 16th Amendment gives the federal government clearly the power to impose an income tax. This was debated before, sort of gone back and forth. Um, now the federal government is going to have a lot more money, right? It's going to have a lot more income. It's going to be able to do a lot more. So the federal government is growing. Awesome. Good point. 17th Amendment. 17th Amendment. Now we've got direct election of the senators. So under the original constitution, state legislatures pick them. They're going to be responsive to the state legislatures. They're going to care maybe about spheres of state authority and state legislative power. Now the people select them, they're not going to care about that. So we're shifting to a nationalist model. Uh, the federal government is going to be more active, probably. Awesome. Now, this is one of my two favorites um, because we had a great exhibit on them, the 18th and the 21st. We'll do them together. Okay, so the 18th Amendment is probably the clearest example of putting a specific policy choice into mm -hmm. the Constitution, a sort of debatable policy choice, and it's also an illustration probably of why you shouldn't do that. <laughs> so America thinks alcohol is bad, and you know, there's a good reason to think that. It's a plausible position, lots of bad consequences, and we get a national amendment. Um, and you might wonder, you know, why can't you leave that up to the states? Why couldn't you just have a federal statute? Complicated reasons, but we do it by constitutional amendment in 1919. So we ban uh, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors. And uh, one of our favorite speakers came um, and spoke about the 18th Amendment. And one of his lines was, um, he wrote the book on prohibition, The Last Call, uh, Dan Okren. And he said, you know, we did have a drinking problem. It wasn't like we didn't have a drinking problem in America. So there's, a, when you look at the historical context, there's a lot of good reason. But we also didn't like this. And so pretty quickly, we got the 21st Amendment. Right. So prohibition was a failure. And you know, as you said, maybe there were some good reasons for it. Uh, it had maybe some good effects, but Americans really weren't willing to abide by it. So you get massive defiance, which is sort of bad in terms of the symbolism, and you get massive criminal activity because now it's illegal. And so the people making profits off of alcohol are criminals. Um, and it just it's a rise in criminal activity. You got like the speakeasies and Al Capone and gangsters and so on. So we decide this is bad. You know, we should bring it out into the open. Again, rather than bathtub gin, we're going to have an industry that we can regulate. And now to one of my favorite amendments is the 19th Amendment. So let's 19th. talk about the 19th. Yes. So also part of the progressive era where, again, like I said, government's getting bigger. We're going to improve government. We're going to make a system that works for everyone. And part of that, of course, is including people in the political process and giving them a voice. So the 19th Amendment guarantees women the right to vote. Awesome. Now we're jumping into the modern era. So we're making it there. Uh, Roosevelt, uh, here we go. The 20th Amendment. Okay. So this is, this is fixing a problem. Um, and maybe, it, maybe it's also illustrating the sort of times change theme. So, you know, why, why should the constitution be amended at all? Because they made some mistakes and because times change. And 20th Amendment accelerates the transition of power. So it used to be that the president and vice president would leave office in March and you'd have this very long lame duck period when people who had been voted out of office were still exercising power. That's undesirable, but technologically, maybe it was hard to do the transition faster. But by 1933, we're capable of doing it faster. We realize it's a better idea. We don't want lame duck people holding office for too long. Um, 
So they move up the transition. Great. And now we jump, we just did the 21st Amendment ending pro, um, prohibition, and now we're jumping to the 22nd Amendment. Right. So the 22nd Amendment is basically responding to FDR. Um, and they decide that it had been a custom. No president would serve more than two terms. Uh, FDR broke that custom and people thought mm, that was maybe undesirable and probably wisely, you know, because FDR accumulated an enormous amount of power and could have done bad things, probably. Um, I don't think he did. I think he did mostly good things. He did some bad things. Um, you know, detention of the Japanese Americans, that was a bad one. And he kind of got away with that maybe in part because he had appointed eight of the justices at the Supreme Court who ruled on that. So probably more than two terms is an undesirable concentration of power in a single person. That's what this is about. I mean, I love about this is, you know, we had a norm in our democracy for years that this norm was two terms and you're done from Washington. And now because of this, we decided it's important enough that we make it a rule and put it into the Constitution. So always looking at what's a norm and what's um, a rule. So that brings us to the 23rd Amendment in 1961. So the 23rd Amendment is a sort of democratizing amendment. I think it's a good step in the right direction. I think it doesn't go far enough. But it used to be that the people of District of Columbia had no voice in federal elections at all. Um, so the 23rd Amendment gives them some voice in the selection of president. They get electors equivalent to the senators and representatives that they would have had if they were a state. They still have no representation in Congress. I think DC should be a state. I think no taxation without representation. So is that your 28th Amendment? <laughs> I got a lot of amendments. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about it at the end because one of our students totally wants to hear your a couple of yeah. yours. So 24th Amendment, this one blows my mind because I cannot believe it isn't until 1964 that poll taxes are ended. So talk a little bit about what kind of made this happen, finally ending poll taxes. Yeah, so this is what people call the second Reconstruction, right? We call Reconstruction the second founding. We call the Civil Rights Movement um, and the Warren Court that era. So late 50s through the 60s into the 70s maybe we call that the second reconstruction because that's when a lot of the constitutional provisions of reconstruction really come alive there's sort of a brief period during reconstruction when we've got integrated governments in the south then they get overthrown by force basically while the federal government stands by and reconstruction is submerged and defeated for almost 100 years um, then it comes back Brown v. Board of Education is part of that. The Civil Rights Acts are part of that. The Voting Rights Act of 1965, crucially, is part of that. And the 24th Amendment is part of it, too, because now we're trying to make the 15th Amendment a reality. So you can say no race discrimination with respect to the right to vote. States can try to get around that. You know, states can have poll taxes. States can have tests that they administer in a discriminatory way. And it's an attempt to really realize the promise of Reconstruction. I would say that's driving this. Fantastic. Now we get to the 25th Amendment. Yeah, so the 25th Amendment is also sort of fixing mistakes or um, clarifying things. The original Constitution provided that if the president died or left office, the duties of the presidency would devolve upon the vice president. But does that mean they're president or not? It wasn't clear. So this clarifies that the vice president actually becomes president. And then it also allows the vice president and a majority of the cabinet to say that the president can't fulfill his or her duties. So this is a provision that lets them take out the president if the president is incapacitated, has gone mad, something like that. Um, but this itself is not actually as clear as it needs to be because it sets up a pretty complicated back and forth struggle if the president is trying to hold power and the vice president and the cabinet are trying to take him out. It ends up passing it off to Congress, but it doesn't tell you who's in charge while Congress is deciding, which is a problem. And um, and is this in reaction to anything that happened? Like, was it was there a moment in in American history that happened that kind of triggered this? Yeah, this is basically in reaction to the Kennedy assassination, where people realize we need to think about succession. We need to think about what happens if the president is incapacitated and not dead. Also. Got it. OK, next we get to the 26th Amendment. Yeah, so this is another one of the pro-democracy amendments. We're expanding the franchise. This is in part in reaction to the Vietnam War, 
So you have the spectacle of Americans with no voice in the political process, right? People who are 18 to 21, they're not allowed to vote if they're under 21, but they're being told they have to lay down their lives to defend this country. And people think, I think reasonably, if the government is going to ask you to lay down your life, they should listen to your voice. Absolutely. And I, th I always find the fascinating uh, part about this one, too, is that it's it's the shortest, correct? I'm remembering that, right? It's only like under four months. Four months. Yeah. <laughs> fastest, fastest ratification. And that's perfect because that leads us to our last one, which is the longest. <laughs> right. So tell us about the 27th. So the 27th Amendment is part of Madison's original package. I mean, it's not that exciting. It's a sort of anti-corruption law. You're worried that um, Congress might vote themselves a giant pay raise and then just take the money. So this is supposed to stop that. So if Congress votes themselves a giant pay raise, which they could do, it doesn't take effect until there's an election, at which point the voters can be like, you're corrupt, you're not getting that pay raise. And they vote the scoundrels out of office. So it's a you know sort of reasonable, good government provision, I guess. But it's not exciting enough to catch fire in the 18th century, it doesn't get ratified by enough states in the original package. Um, and then here comes Gregory Watson. So Gregory Watson is a student um, at the University of Texas, and he's writing a paper for some government class and comes across the 27th Amendment. And he's looking at it, he's like, huh, hasn't been ratified. And then he's like, hasn't been ratified yet, because there's no time limit. So the more recent amendments Congress often puts in a time limit. The 27th Amendment has no time limit. It's been ratified by a bunch of states, but not enough. And Gregory Watson's like, you know what? This could still be ratified. So he writes his paper saying, this could still be ratified. And amazingly, the professor is like, no, that's a bad paper, and gives him a C. And Gregory Watson's like, what are you talking about? This is a good idea, and I'm going to show you. So he goes out trying to get support for this idea that 27th Amendment can still be ratified. Um, and kind of amazingly, he does. And so a lot of this has to do with Senator William Cohen of Maine, who's like the first powerful political figure who really got excited about it. But then like Maine ratifies in 1983 and the push gains momentum. Um, and in 1992, you get to the 38 threshold. So you get, you get to three quarters. And 202 years after it's proposed, this amendment actually becomes part of the Constitution. That's awesome. I love that story. I love that the teacher went back and fixed the grade. Um, and this is uh, Gregory Watson, not at the age of a student, but the age of the grade fix. Right. But it is, I just think it's a really important to talk, like look through those old amendments and kind of like parse out, did we miss anything? Were there good ones that were up? And that brings me to Taylor's question. Um, Taylor's question was, are there any amendments that are connected to women's rights, women's equality, and that that easily connects to the time limit as well. So can you talk a little bit about some of those amendments and maybe the ERA? Yeah, so it connects to the ERA, which was the Sex Equality Equal Rights Amendment, um, which had a time limit. So this is the problem. So the ERA is moving along sort of like the 27th Amendment. Um, it made a lot of progress, it kind of stalled, some states ratified, some states tried to withdraw their ratifications, there's a question about whether that's effective. But more recently, more states have been ratifying. And so the question is, if the ERA gets across the threshold after the time limit has expired, is it part of our Constitution? Um, and that depends on you know what you think about Congress's ability to set a time limit, it depends a little bit on the effect of state attempts to withdraw ratification. Um, it's a complicated question. It is. It's tricky. And we'll send some resources out so you can see the different kind of stages where it is and the conversations around that. Now, uh, one of our other students, Bryce, wanted to know, uh, Professor Roosevelt, what's your favorite amendment? Or at least, because Jeff can never answer that question, so it's okay if you can't either. What's the one that you're right now really jazzed about digging into more? Oh, yeah, I can 100% answer that. It's the 14th. The 14th is is everything that makes America great. Awesome. I love um, it. So you I have a answer. lot more to say about that. There's just no way to go into it now. Um, yeah. 
It's great. It's wonderful. And then um, one of the other questions that we had that I will use this as the last final wrap up question. And you did a fantastic job. You really got us through all of them in almost the right amount of time. Um, one of the questions that our students asked earlier, and I'm going to have to do it to you. Could you tell them about your last name? Because they just noticed some similarities. Oh, uh, yeah. So we were talking about FDR before, uh, and I was like, oh, actually, he did some good things, did some bad things. Um, I'm not directly connected to FDR. I'm Theodore Roosevelt's great great grandson. And Theodore Roosevelt, in contrast to FDR, was like, I will observe the two term limit, even though he didn't really have to, because he was elected once. He took office once because McKinley was assassinated. He could have run for another term, um, which initially he didn't do. And then he's like, I'm going to do it as an independent. So um, he was a greater respecter of constitutional norms than FDR, I would say. Um, and he is my great great grandfather. So that's the connection. Am I related to the green Kermit? Well, so if you look at the popularity of the name Kermit, um, it rises a lot after Theodore Roosevelt names his second son Kermit. So I feel that Kermit the Frog must have been inspired by that. There's like a Kermit Texas, actually, that's named for Theodore's son. Um, and ultimately, yeah, that's that's where my name comes from, too. Awesome. And I do love the, that uh, there's a website where you can drop in your name and kind of see the different time periods where it becomes very, very popular. So I love that you referenced that because it is really interesting and you can look at those historical contexts around it. So Professor Roosevelt, thank you so much. This was really fun. I'm super proud of us that we got through all 27. And students, great conversation in the chat, great in the Q&A. We've all done wonderful today. And we'll see, keep pondering and thinking about what are those patterns and what are those opportunities opportunities when we think about what could be the 28th Amendment. Um, so feel free to keep dropping them in the chat. We'll save the chat and share it with everybody with lots of different ideas, books, resources, and everything. So Professor Roosevelt, thank you so much. It was great to have you in class today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Always thanks. a pleasure. I'm going to officially stop the recordings now.